Okay, so welcome everyone. I can hear this beeping, beeping sound. Welcome everyone on this webinar on agro food jobs for youth in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. This webinar is organized by the thematic working group on rural youth employment of the Global Donor Platform on Rural Development. My name is Gian Rim. I'm a senior policy, policy analyst at the OECD Development Center. And I'm also one of the co-chairs of the thematic working group. And uh, together with Elizenda Etruk uh, Puerta uh, from ILO, I'll be moderating your, uh, your webinar today. I just want to uh, also uh, let you know there's a chat box. So, so if you have any questions you want to forget, please um, uh, write it down. There will be an opportunity to, to ask questions live, uh, but we will also um, take into consideration, consideration any uh, questions in the chat box. So, right. So today we are presenting the key findings uh, from a recent study by the OECD <clears throat> on agri-food jobs for youth in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. Uh, but before we get to the main presentation, let me just first give you a brief background uh, and rationale of the study. So this study is uh, one of the outputs of a larger OECD uh, project called COVID-19 Response and Recovery in MENA region. It was financed by the government of Italy to support countries in the Middle East and North um, African region in their recovery from the economic and social consequences of the COVID crisis. The rationale for focusing on youth is, is, uh, is a quite an obvious one. Uh, globally, youth represent the largest group ever to enter the transition to adulthood. And in the MENA region, uh, the, the youth rep can represent as much as 50% of the population. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had a particularly devastating um, effect on the most vulnerable populations like youth, women, and informal workers. And many ongoing programs for youth uh, risk being um, having their budget uh, shifted away towards other priorities. So as you can imagine, uh, leaving out youth from society's uh, core development sectors can uh, generate social and economic costs and even lead to social and political unrest, as you may have recalled from 2011. So this study addresses these questions. Uh, how can we urgently support this youthful population uh, so that uh, the region, uh, countries like Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia have the potential to realize a demographic dividend? What are missed opportunities we need to tap into? What are challenges specific to this, uh, to this region, to these countries that require more attention? So without further ado, let me turn uh, over to Maria Aleksinska. Maria is a senior economist at the OECD and one of the lead authors of this study. Uh, she has previously worked for the ILO and CEPI, and she has many, many years of experience and is an expert in informal economy, skills development, and international migration, among others. So, um, Maria, please tell us what you have found. Yes, uh, thank you very much, June, for this uh, in, uh, fantastic introduction. Uh, greetings, uh, dear colleagues, dear participants. Uh, before I proceed, let me share my screen with you because I prepared a presentation and that uh, will help us. Uh, please uh, let me know if you can see it. Yep, we see it. Okay, great. So, uh, so let's go. So, indeed, um, uh, late uh, last year we uh, uh, we published uh, at the OECD the study on agri food jobs for youth uh, uh, in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia that um, I will uh, present uh, for you today. So, uh, as I go uh, in the presentation, uh, I will briefly stop on the rationale uh, for for the study and then speak about profiles of young people, but also opportunities and challenges in the agri-food sector in the three selected countries, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. And then we'll see how to, uh, how to connect uh, the dots uh, between, uh, between these uh, issues. Uh, so June has already laid down the rationale for this whole project. And what I have to add to that is that undoubtedly, uh, youth is uh, the biggest asset uh, that the MENA region has. So the objective of the study was uh, somehow to highlight how employment in one sector, 
agri-food can provide economic opportunities and improve livelihoods of young people in the MENA region, with a special focus on Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. Uh, and to run ahead, um, I'd like to say that this study makes the case that developing the agro-food value chain represents untapped opportunities to help address the youth and employment problem in these three countries. Uh, and in fact, our case is built around these three observations. <clears throat> so the first key observation is regarding the profiles of the young people. So this is where I'll go a little bit more uh, in detail. Uh, so what we know, and most of you probably know, but it's good to uh, recall some, some key facts uh, and really look uh, specifically at the data, uh, is uh, that the demographic profile of the region is quite specific. Uh, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia are in the midst of their demographic transition. Currently, children and young people constitute over 49% of the total population in Egypt and around 40% in Morocco and Tunisia. And as can be seen from this figure in front of you, between 2020 and 2035, the massive influx of new young entrants into the labor markets will continue because it is already ongoing. And of course, these people will be demanding jobs and hopefully good quality jobs. Many of these young workers still will continue living in rural areas. What we also know is that the vast majority of these young peoples ha people have or will have only a medium or low level of skill. And this is because despite a significant progress that has been made uh, in the last decades to improve school enrollment, including for female students, much room for improvement still exists. In terms of school quantity, the data show a substantial decline for out-of-school children, but we should continue because as you can see on the figure here, there is still quite a substantial share of children who, um, who are dropping out of school too early. Moreover, very importantly, there is also a need to increase the quality of schooling and especially equip bet students better with the skills that are immediately relevant for the labor markets. Indeed, this is a big issue because what we observe also in the region is that the school to work transition remain very challenging uh, for everybody, but especially for young women. What we know is that the shares of uh, individuals, of youth who are neither in employment, education, or in training in many countries are above global averages and are particularly high for young women. Labor market transitions are long, and uncertain, and they are also discouraging young, many young people from work. Finally, youth unemployment rates are the highest in the world. What we also observe is that when young people do step into the labor market, they actually face also a lot of vulnerability and decent work challenges. Um, so uh, first of all, the agriculture actually remains um, a key entry point for young people often reflecting a lack of choice, uh, a lack of opportunities elsewhere. This is uh, the most uh, immediate and straightforward choice for many. Uh, but also the employment, whether in agriculture or elsewhere for use, is highly precarious quite often, and often um, is taking place in informal jobs and, we also, and, and also features underemployment. Um, so given this challenging situation, Many of these young people do aspire uh, to having more quantity and quality of work and to better use their time, their skill, their overall potential. However, too often their aspirations show a mismatch between the real expectations and the reality. So again, here I join uh, June in saying that it is really imperative that the governments take action to provide the youth with the opportunities for doing so, for improving the match, uh, fitting their expectations, um, and uh, and this can help also improving the, the life, livelihoods uh, and also a better social climate. So this is kind of the first observation that we have regarding the demographic the demographic profile, and I actually invite you to, to have a look at the report where you will find many more details. Uh, uh, this is just a really snapshot of, uh, of the main, uh, main issues. Now, another observation that we have is that so this being said, we see that uh, the second observation concerns the development and the current state of one sector, which is the agro-food sector, with agro-food value chains in these three countries of the region. 
So what is interesting and specific about this? Uh, well, first of all, the agri-food is a strategically important sector for the MENA region in general and for the three countries that we chose to have a specific focus on. It is a strategic sector that ensures uh, food security, provides essential employment and economic opportunities, as we will see, but it is also a sector that is affected by a range of external factors. Uh, for example, uh, currently there is the increasing population, but also the raising, rising uh, per capita incomes will definitely uh, increase demand for agri-food products and also alter diets. So this is something that we see in other countries that are following the demographic transition path, and this is what we're expecting to see in the MENA region. Uh, also, what will happen is that urbanization will increase uh, demand for processed and prepared convenience foods, as is happening in many countries, as well as for foods that are served through restaurants and catering. Finally, changing food purchasing habits through the growth goal of uh, supermarkets uh, will also take place. Yet, this being said, uh, there are also many kind of, let's say, negative trends and um, where we put the red flags. So, of course, this is the climate change, but also multiple international crises, um, with, uh, with, um, which leads to uh, raising full in food insecurity, uh, which raised to, uh, lead to increased uh, prices. And so a growing number of individuals in the region that are actually, well, facing the food, uh, food insecurity uh, and not doing uh, so well. So as we can see, these all of these changes, what happens is that they represent both challenges, but also opportunities, right? And so as policymakers, we're interested in seeing how grasping these opportunities can help meet the evolving local demand while also providing socioeconomic benefits in terms of better employment, including for use. So now let's have a, a little bit of a closer look at the agri-food sector, how it is organized to try to understand better where the bottlenecks and challenges are, and again, where opportunities can be developed. So the agri-food sector is organized within and across domestic and global value chains. Uh, so the domestic agriculture, uh, primary agriculture production is the key node of any agri-food chain. It has what we call uh, backward linkages that connect agriculture production to other industries, such as chemical industries producing, producing fertilizers, pesticides, to machinery production, et cetera, et cetera. So in the MENA region, many of these backward linkages are currently uh, ensured through connections to the international markets, or simply said, imports. Domestic primary agriculture production also has what we call forward linkages, through which pr production is stored, aggregated, transported, then it is processed, used as inputs in manufacturing of food and beverages, packed, and then distributed to accommodate the wholesale or retail trade, or to be used in restoration and catering. What we know from experience of other countries throughout the world, value added to agricultural production through the forward linkages is more important than the value added through backward linkages. And this actually, this finding provides the economic rationale for developing such forward linkages domestically. However, our observation is that in the MENA region, domestic generation of the value added remains largely unexploited. In other words, the domestic value addition and the benefits that it can bring in terms of employment, wages, profits are yet to be seized. So diving a little bit deeper in the domestic primary agriculture production, uh, what we know about it is that it is evolving under the array of environmental and climate change factors, as well as other external uh, factors, which already I mentioned, related to world prices and export distributions. So in order to ensure its sustainability and competitiveness, we need some sort of policy action to ensure that the sector can adapt to these numerous challenges. There are also other challenges that I have listed here regarding land and water resources, the choice of crops, concerns over high dependence on staple food uh, that preclude from greater development and 
uh, of uh, horticulture, um, climate change effects on fisheries, aquaculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, again, most of the adaptations that what will happen that will happen, we see and we we again uh, provide details on this in the report. Much of this adjustment would need to be stimulated through improved productivity and labor adjustments. So while the total demand for labor in agriculture will probably continue declining as it is happening in many uh, in many uh, other countries, what will happen is that the demand will rise for semi-skilled and highly skilled specialists with a diverse set of skills, although at different di divergent rates across different subsectors of agriculture. Uh, and this will occur also in the context of various other transformations, such as adoption of climate smart agriculture, changes in average farm size, ownership structures, the transition from family to hired labor, testing phases of new types of agriculture produce, modern mechanization, introduction of new technologies, and so forth. So to ensure that employment in the sector remains an attractive option, especially for younger generation, these changes, again, need to be underpinned by effective policies. Now, let me very briefly uh, say a few words about other nodes of the agri-foods um, value chains. Uh, for example, the post-harvesting, storage, transportation, and logistics distribution. Um, this is a segment that is critical to prevent wastage of agricultural pro produce and of food, to preserving resources, and also to better capture the value of agricultural production and in general to connect all other nodes of the chain between themselves. So while these sectors have relatively modest employment potential, their role in the smooth functioning and development of the whole chain cannot be underestimated. If we have a closer look at food processing and manufacturing of food, this is also one of the uh, very interesting uh, very interesting cases. In fact, this node of the um, agro-food value chain is the key value-adding node of the chain. It is the main linkage between the farm and the shelf, and together with uh, primary agriculture production, it represents one of the MENAS region's most attractive economic opportunities. So as you can see on this graph, in terms of value added, Food processing and manufacturing of food is the top manufacturing industry in Morocco, and it ranks second uh, in both Egypt and Tunisia. In terms of employment, it is the top industry in Egypt and second in Morocco and Tunisia. The sector is expected to experience the greatest transformations in the nearest decades. It has a strong potential to contribute to rural development and the development of small and medium-sized cities and also absorb the largest shares of semi-skilled workforce, precisely the type of workforce that we have observed uh, um, in, the, in the general population uh, in, in these countries. There are, of course, some bottlenecks as well for development of this sector. They include fragmentation, missing segments and sub subsegments of the chain, some limited capacities of small and medium enterprises, inconsistent quality of domestic inputs, and shortage of qualified labor with specific technical and managerial skills. So quite clearly, capturing the social economic potential of this sector, again, would require strategic public and private planning, investment, cooperation, and again, policy coordination. Finally, the food consumption node uh, is the last node of the chain as we presented it, uh, and um, whether retail or restaurants, it is also expected to continue expanding in the MENA region in the future. It has already contributed to the absorption of a large chunk of the urban population, including women and young people, and its role is expected to continue growing, especially in medium-sized cities. So now the big question is, so how do we connect the dots, right? So our report argues that in order to turn the agri-food sector into an engine for youth social economic empowerment, we really have to have a certain vision of the agri-food sector. What we argue in the report is that this vision relies on strategic decisions, investments, and policy actions 
that needs to be implemented already now. And this vision would have two main pillars. The first pillar is the development of the agro-food value chain itself. And the second pillar is the skill development for young people. And when, when we speak about young people, it is both the future entrance into the agro-food labor market, but it is also the young people who are already on the labor market. And the policies would not be the same for the two types of people. So again, our report really goes into a lot of detail, providing very uh, concrete, specific examples on how this can be done. So in the interest of time, I will just very briefly cover and provide kind of a few uh, guiding ideas of what we mean by the policies under these two pillars, and I will leave the rest to the discussion. So um, when we say that it is important to ensure the first pillar, it is important to ensure a smooth development of diverse agri-food value chains, we mean that there are certain things that should be done by the government. One of the activities we believe is that the government should take a key role in channeling the development of domestic value chain and activities in non-farm employment where they deliver the greatest social economic benefits. So this is where there should be forecasting, planning, and encouragement of both public and also private investments to go into those you know, places where, where the social economic uh, benefits should be the greatest. Another thing is investment in those projects that otherwise would remain underdeveloped. Examples um, can include building uh, key infrastructure, uh, irrigation facilities, et cetera, et cetera, something that may not happen on its own or where private uh, investment, especially of small scale, will not suffice or will not, uh, will not provide sufficient benefits. Um, investing in infrastructure to improve rural urban linkages with the aim of developing the agri-food uh, value chain, supporting the adoption of new technologies and innovation throughout the whole value chain, and also adopting necessary food safety and environmental laws and standards. Again, we can, we can speak about concrete details later on. Regarding the second pillar, the skill development, so as we said, there are two uh, aspects. So um, equipping the future young workers with the right skills to the entire uh, to enter the agri-food. Uh, this implies policies in the areas of skill development and labor, which would be aimed at ensuring that future workers are equipped with solid foundational cognitive, social, and emotional skills as a precondition of building any other type of skill. Uh, smoothing school-to-work transitions by investing into modern technical skills that are relevant for the agri-food sector and that are delivered through TVET systems. Integrating digital skills for agri-food professions into the curricular at all levels and types of training. But also attracting students to tertiary education that is relevant to the agri-food sector. And finally, anticipating skill challenge and raising awareness about it. Finally, the last uh, pillar and sub-pillar, which is adapting skills and labor market policies targeted at youth that is already on the labor market, we put forward the following ideas. Equipping young workers with the right technical uh, skills through the enterprise training. The role of enterprise training should not be underestimated in this regard, but sometimes uh, more incentive to enterprise uh, training should be provided by the government. Providing skill upgrading possibilities through public programs for young workers that would take into account their specific needs. Supporting a wide range of opportunities for skill upgrading and reskilling. Also recognizing skills and prior learning. Quite often youth does have skills, but they obtain them through informal work or informal learning. And the absence of recognition actually precludes them from accessing to better jobs from accessing to credit, for example, to develop their own business, et cetera. Supporting youth entrepreneurs to ensure that they succeed. Leveraging the potential of agricultural advisory services. These are the type of services that exist in many countries and are done on a semi-informal, very applied, practical way um, and help with uh, both skill development, but also different types of information, how to set up 
and operate your business in the sector. And finally, empowering women in the agro food sector. So all of this also has to be accompanied, we believe, with also broader labor market policies, of course, uh, especially those uh, that are related to decent work, uh, to good working conditions, uh, to social dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. And here, I guess my uh, ILO colleagues will uh, will award the same. So with this, yes, in fact, I wanted to, to mention this as well, but uh, uh, creating the right enabling business environment, supporting smallholder businesses, uh, supporting sustainable job creation and improving working conditions through better labor regulations, social protection, social dialogue. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention and I welcome you to have a look uh, at our report. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Maria. Very uh, rich information. Um, so let me, uh, I think for the audience, I'll let you maybe uh, digest a bit and then uh, we can maybe after the two discussions, ask questions to any uh, of the panelists, if that's okay. So let me now introduce um, our first discussant. So it's uh, Chiara Curcio. She's a technical officer in the Youth Employment Promotion at the uh, International Labor Organization, ILO. Chiara, Chiara's work focuses on rural youth employment and she leads uh, this team within the Youth Accelerator Group. So Chiara, please <clears throat> give us some of your uh, sort of feedback on, on what we have uh, just uh, presented, but also please share with us uh, some of ILO's own experience and projects related to agri-food and rural youth employment, and in particular uh, in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very happy and glad to participate to this webinar. And I really would like to start by congratulating to Maria and the team for the excellent work in producing this report. It's, it's very interesting and it really draws the attention on very important uh, points that of course touch upon uh, North Africa and the three countries that you have covered, but they're very much aligned to several other countries in the continent and even beyond. So again, thank you very much. Um, I, again, maybe uh, Maria already uh, highlighted that at the end of her presentation, there were many interesting aspects that are at the heart of the work of the ILO, including especially uh, the, the policy work in order to uh, promoting an enabling environment to promote decent jobs for youth, especially in the agri-food sector. Um, I... Um, in order to you know, comment on the presentation, but also to maybe pick up on specific elements that Maria touched upon in her presentation. Um, if you allow, I prepared a very short presentation just to support me in, uh, in a different aspect that I, I wish to cover. So one second, please. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, Maria already presented very interesting uh, statistics and demographics, uh, especially on on uh, on the Middle East, uh, in Middle East and North Africa. But I really would like to uh, re-highlight a few of them that really uh, tricked my attention. And of course, we already mentioned that most of more or less one in three people in North Africa lives in rural areas. But Maria mentioned and strengthened the importance of the agricultural sector and, and the role that this sector plays in producing employment, especially for young people. Uh, what I would like to uh, to maybe add up to these, uh, you know, uh, said the scene type of thing, uh, I would like also to stress that the social protection coverage, especially in this region, is still very low, so not even 20%. And this is even more so in rural areas and for young people. Now, uh, we are now in a moment where we are you know, post COVID-19 response policies in a multi-crisis uh, setting. And according to our latest report uh, from the ILO 2024 on the World Economic Social Outlook for North Africa, 
uh, it continues to exhibit a lower participation rate, driven especially by low levels of female participation. So there is a problem at the level of employment, generally speaking, of young people and female young workers are even more you know, hit by, uh, by this context. And what is really important for, uh, for youth is that most of the time they are excluded from social dialogue. That is the main driver for uh, promoting inclusive policy policies uh, and uh, in order to promote decent jobs. Now, uh, the, the overall strategy is to, uh, to stimulate an inclusive rural transformation so that, you know, of course, it's driven by uh, the agriculture, the agri-food sectors, but, you know, try also to, to uh, touch upon several levels of vulnerabilities. Um, it is very important to really work on developing policies plans, st strategies, so to really work on the policy framework at different levels and different dimension. Uh, and in order to um, really secure that this uh, policy development uh, is inclusive and you know really at the core of the specific challenges faced by young people, um, social dialogue in the rural economy is really something very important in order to really channel the specific issues faced by young people in these areas to be translated into policy and actions. Um, partnership is absolutely something very important in order to create concrete actions on the ground. And uh, uh, there are many actors playing an important role in the, uh, uh, rural development. Uh, we, we, we have here in this panel, many of them, but I also would like to mention also the importance of broader partnership that really try to build upon the specific value added of any actors playing uh, uh, in this environment, such as the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth that the ILO is leading in the context of the UN system. and. Uh, Within the initiative, there is a dedicated and thematic plan of action on the rural economy uh, that I'm more than happy to share in the chat more information about that. Uh, I would like to really summarize my intervention by providing a concrete example of a project that the ILO is leading in Algeria. It's not part of the specific countries covered by the report, but I thought it would be interesting for the audience also to uh, provide some information on a concrete uh, project that is financed by IFAD. And it's part of a broader IFAD program on agribusiness hubs, uh, on integrated agribusiness hubs. And this is actually the key word, integrated. So Maria uh, highlighted the two plus one important pillars uh, uh, out of her findings uh, that are, if I can summarize in my own words, basically looking at the demand side through you know, developing the agri-food sectors and also the supply side by empowering young people and equipping young people with, with skills. Um, uh, and also at the end, she mentioned the importance of, of policy and also the intermediary action uh, between labor demand and labor supply. The project objective is exactly to uh, enable an environment that touches upon these three elements. So uh, developing the agri-food sector, uh, uh, equipping young people with specific skills. Um, and what we are really trying as ILO and partnering uh, with the IFAD is to try to have a dedicated focus on wage employment. So how can we promote wage employment opportunities for rural youth in the agri-food sectors, in addition to other type of interventions such as uh, enterprise development and uh, enterprise acceleration? Um, now, uh, just really to, to give you an, uh, an highlight, um, Maria, uh, I think that you really uh, did an excellent work in unpacking the concept of the agri-food sectors, especially when we discuss and we uh, touch upon wage employment, we really need to go into the granularity of the value chains. So uh, agricultural production, of course, is one of the most important uh, sector uh, where uh, employment uh, is very important. But when we talk about decent jobs, and if we really want to promote decent jobs for youth, 
uh, in terms of wage employment opportunities, we really need to go beyond production and really look at the different aspects and segments of the value chain where young people can also express themselves and also, you know, try to align their as work aspirations uh, together with uh, their um, um, geographical um, settings in, in rural areas. Uh, in Algeria, we indeed work a lot, for example, on tomato uh, processing, uh, dry tomatoes processing, where young women feel absolutely re-empowered. You know? So it's also, there are so many synergies that are happening at the ground when we really try to connect also the aspiration of, of rural youth with uh, concrete uh, employment opportunities. Now, the idea of the, now getting back one second to the idea of the integrated agribusiness hubs, these young people get trained. And what is really important is that the specific training modules are demand-driven. So as ILO, we try to leverage our tripartite nature, working closely with employers' organizations, with workers' organizations, in order to design and develop modules that are meaningful also for the firms that at the end are asked to hire and absorb these, these new forces, labor forces coming out of this process. Uh, the skills that have been um, uh, uh, developed are not necessarily technical skills. Of course, this is very important, especially those that are linked to sustainable uh, agricultural practices that can, you know, uh, uh, try to adapt to the climate change, but also soft skills that are very important for employers when they're hiring young workers and also digital skills in order to also uh, promote uh, um, different uh, businesses also in the digital market. Uh, also being considered of time, I would like really to highlight very specific success stories coming from Algeria. Uh, I already mentioned uh, how we managed to empower young women in the dry tomatoes transformation in the region of Guelma. Uh, this also has, you know, the project is, is a pilot project, is very short, but already after one year of implementation, we are observing how the communities are developing uh, um, a cohesion, a strengthening of cohesion at the community level, just because, you know, all these young women managed to connect, you know, their, their work um, uh, through the project. Um, and again, another important aspect that I would like to mention is that uh, the ILO is really working closely with the local institutions, uh, but also at the national level with the Ministry of Labor and Agriculture to promote the social dialogue that is a con uh, conducive element to extend the existing apprenticeship framework in Algeria and extend this framework also to agriculture sector. And this is really one of the most important achievements uh, that I really would like to share, the importance of how really to work closely with different actors and partners at the local level and at the national level to really create uh, a pathway towards decent jobs opportunities. Um, this, of course, includes also working with uh, uh, financial institutions to promote also access to finance. And uh, I would like really to uh, end my presentation saying that uh, what we really observe in Algeria is that youth participation played an important role in uh, uh, conducive success when it comes really to uh, activities and operations by meaningfully engage young people in the decision making in in the design of the project in the implementation we really manage to really go beyond barriers that usually practitioners face when working with rural youth and through the youth we managed to access the most remote areas of Algeria and really get into, um, to really connect uh, with the most vulnerable people that at the end is uh, the main purpose of this type of intervention. So thank you very much, uh, Juan. I hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, I get over to you. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. <clears throat> thank you, Chiara. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Thank you, you've highlighted really important messages, um, social dialogue involving different stakeholders and most importantly, involving the youth themselves 
I think for rural youth, it's even more challenging because of um, sort of the intimidation of, of this type of social dialogue. Um, you know, it, it, it can be quite, um, you know, intimidating for maybe low uh, educated um, youth, et cetera. So I think it's really important to empower them, especially uh, in rural areas. And I like the fact that this project focused a lot on wage employment because often we tend to, in rural areas, encourage, um, you know, entrepreneurship. And as uh, many studies we have done also in OECD shows that entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs is not for everybody. It's certainly not, it's not for me. <laughs> so so I, I think it's the same in, 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 uh, in, in, in rural areas and agriculture sector. I mean, not everyone can be entrepreneurs and I think we need to promote more wage employment um, as a form of decent work. So thank you so much for, for these important messages. Uh, let me now turn over to uh, Federica de Gaetano from the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, or AICS. So Federica is a food security and rural development expert at AICS. She's also the focal point on food security uh, for various working groups at the European Commission, the Group of Seven, the UN, and as well as for the our own global donor platform. Um, she manages international cooperation initiatives in the field of food and nutrition security, sustainable agriculture, and rural development. Welcome, Federica. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, please um, tell us what what are your thoughts on what's been uh, you know uh, shared here today, and also what are some lessons from Ike's, Ike's projects related to agri food, rural youth employment, in particular in this very difficult region, challenging region. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting uh, me and um, in general our agency uh, to this webinar. Uh, thanks a lot for the report, for the OECD report. I think that is very um, useful. Um, there are uh, lots of um, input and uh, information uh, on the report that can be useful for our um, daily uh, job at the agency. Uh, in particular, um, let me just say that we share, of course, the consideration that uh, the Mediterranean area is a context where youth and employment, uh, inflation, uh, and political economical instability generate uh, in general. Uh, popular discontent and human mobility. Um, this is an area as well particularly affected by food insecurity uh, in this historical moment, in particular after the COVID and the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Um, in particular, I was uh, particularly um, put attention on specific, uh, um, we can say, uh, input uh, from the report. So thanks a lot to the, uh, for your presentation. And um, I mean, for me, I would like to underline, for example, the fact that I was pretty shocked that the youth unemployment rates in men are currently the highest in the world. So this is very, very important to mention. And we share as well that we know, I mean, we know already that land and water resources are scarce. And this is a very important aspect. For example, um, they are very worried about the water. You know, that this topic is really under line by by the the, the, the local uh, and um, uh, of course from um, agriculture point of view it, it will be important the choice of crops um, to optimize the use of resources and economic uh, out, outcomes Mm, um, I would like also to underline, for example, the, the importance of the not only the food security, but also the food safety, as uh, was already mentioned. Uh, so for us, uh, it will be important to uh, really ensure that the, the youth and women and all the workers in general um, are equipped with the solid um, foundation, social, and, uh, and also um, competent skill um, that is really a precondition for building uh, a, 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 for, to have the, 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 the development of, the, of the, the, the job of the society and to, to improve and um, oversee I mean, all the, the, the issues that we have and the problem that we have. 
Uh, so first of all, um, uh, say that <laughs> I would like just to make uh, you a uh, short, I will try to be short uh, in, uh, in present our work. Um, just um, I will share my screen. Let me know if you can see. Yes, we can see. Okay. So first of all, um, the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation uh, has uh, is a headquarter in Rome with the technical hub in Florence and 19 field offices uh, around the world, as you can see. Um, in, um, I will just give you some number for um, in 2022. Um, this is the, the amount of the, the money uh, that we will use to make initiative uh, um, and to, to develop development initiative on all the field of course um, as you can see so in the in the rural development uh, but also in um, in health in the um, uh, in peace um, mainly we can say that our um, our uh, initiative uh, are uh, following and uh, answering to the 5P of the Agenda 2030. Um, and, uh, and we have, of course, cross-cutting themes like uh, gender, uh, like water, disability, and uh, culture, um, and environment as well. Um, so for us, uh, for example, we put in all the initiative, I would like to say that this is very um, new news for, for us, I mean, uh, that uh, Italian cooperation took the, 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 um, uh, the, the, um, the commitment uh, to have, uh, like, um, for all the initiative, uh, the 10% um, for the, um, with the, the, the marker gender uh, principal and all the others um, significant. So this means that uh, we put a lot of attention on the gender, um, but as well uh, also on youth for us, um, this is very important. Um, here we have the, the, our field offices in the area, MENA area, in the Mediterranean area and in Balkan. So in particular, um, we have, for example, I took some uh, example and I, I would like to show you uh, our um, uh, initiative in particular in Tunisia and Egypt, for example. Um, and here we have, uh, first of all, the objective, of the Agenda 2030, uh, and this is the main executor of our project. Of course, we work in uh, with uh, with different kind of uh, with all the we can say stakeholders uh, that support us to um, to implement our initiative. Um, so. I work in particular in the Rural Development and Food Security Office, uh, where the thematic priority are, um, as you can see, food um, agri-food chain, support for smallholders, cooperativism and responsible investment, food and nutrition security, agroecology approach, where the crossing uh, cross cutting themes, where you can say, um, you can see, I mean, sorry, uh, you, there are also youth and um, we women and vulnerable groups. Um, for us, so this is very, very important. Um, in our um, field offices uh, in, in Tunis, in, in Tunisia, sorry, um, Tunisia is responsible for also for uh, Libya, uh, Morocco, and, and Algeria. Uh, and uh, here, uh, as you can see, we have uh, um, that the, the agency is investing more in the ecological and sustainable transition, promotion of local production, uh, triggering mechanism for food and energy self-sufficiency, and social and solidarity economical models. Um, here you can have a review of uh, how many initiatives we have for each kind of area and uh, for which amount. So in particular for rural development and food security, um, the, the, the ICE is present in the southern region of Tunisia um, that are particularly affected by climate change, uh, where um, they try I mean, to promote the integrated development of rural community and efficient use of natural resources. Um, the fight against the, the certification, as I said, as I mentioned, the water is very important. Um, stabilizing of cost and 
border community, diversification of product uh, production and income, and in particular, um, also the promotion. Now we have some initiatives that are starting promoting the organic sector through the creation of bio territories and the blue economy. This is some example of a specific initiative on, uh, on in Tunisia, um, uh, where you can see that uh, we found the same EL element that we, we mentioned, like local agriculture, micro enterprises, but also empowerment of women and young people, uh, sustainable agri-food um, and uh, um, agriculture and tourism in general in Tunisia. So um, these are two programs in Tunisia that are very important, for example, and uh, in particular, um, uh, through this kind of um, program, um, the, um, the, 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 the is, I mean, uh, is ongoing the promotion of the private sector in Tunisia. Uh, um, and um, this is financed, the first one, ADAPT, is uh, financed by uh, European Union, uh, targeting uh, private investment as a driver of economic social and environmental changes. Um, this is quite news, brand news, this kind of program, but Prasoc uh, is, uh, a, uh, is already ongoing. Uh, and for Prasoc, we had already um, eight the eight um, operation that means there were there were some uh, investment on specific and um, a small medium enterprise uh, local in enterprise it was very successful program because with this kind of support the the, the, the small and medium enterprise had the possibility to grow and to um, to have a, to to have a good um, a very important uh, development of the their own uh, business. Um, in this sense, of course, there was the promotion of, of a specific uh, aspect in Prasoc, like, uh, like, for example, the engagement of women, youth, uh, but also um, organic product, uh, different kind of aspect were promoted. In Egypt, uh, for example, we have, uh, as, uh, as I already mentioned, different kind of intervention, um, as well uh, on rural development, as you can see, is quite um, the biggest. Um, and, um, and we have, for example, here some specific initiative, um, just to mention some of them, of course, uh, like, for example, the, the, the um, Egypt, Egyptian cotton value chain. This is a, a project where the, the cotton um, value chain is promoted. That is very important for, uh, for the area. Uh, and uh, the other one are, for example, agriculture mechanization system. This is another important aspect of the project. For example, we saw that, um, that uh, for, uh, for uh, Egyptian uh, small and medium enterprise or in, in general for small holders also, there was very important to have have the possibility to, to access the to, um, uh, mechanization system to, uh, to some machine and uh, to, in order uh, to, um, um, to have um, the, the really a good um, implement of their own business as well. Um, and there was a sort of organization uh, with um, cooperatives, we can say, in order to, uh, to allow the small orders to, uh, um, to use the, the end of access to uh, mechanization system. Um, and th these are our product uh, program are in particular on uh, focusing on the dairy sector, for example, that is also very important for the area. Yeah. Um, last project that I wanted to mention is the, 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 um, the tomato agroindustrial chain that is a partner with Unido. And um, in this case, we have uh, the, the, yes, the developing of tomato industrial chain, but in this case, in a, in a sustainable integrated manner, because uh, we, we were ha having as well some problem linked to the food safety of the tomato from Egypt. So um, it's very important to to, uh, to promote the, the sustainable uh, uh, development of the, the, the chain. Um, finally, I wanted to say that uh, um, the, 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 in Italy is very, 
keen I mean is like uh, working a lot uh, in the area in the in particular concerning the food security um, they are promoting uh, a lot of exchange and uh, policy in order to um, make um, and to help and support this area to oversee this kind of uh, um, problem linked to an unemployment uh, to the development of agribusiness and in particular um, as an um, Italian agency we participate to the Italian Mediterranean Minister Dialogue um, with the participation of FAO and Union for the Mediterranean that was in 2022, then following by um, some event uh, linked to the food policy for Mediterranean city, in particular in this case uh, linked to the urban food policy. Um, finally, we had also a minister, uh, high level ministerial mission of food security in Egypt, Tunisia and Albania. 2023, um, where um, all the Italian development cooperation system participate, uh, and also the, um, uh, the top management of main Italian companies in the agriculture and agri-food sector invo was involved. Um, uh, really to promote the, uh, um, the, the participation of private uh, in order to optimize uh, the agro food um, business and in, uh, in, um, at the local level, so in the main area. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Federica. Very uh, rich presentation. I'm, uh, we are reassured to, to note that uh, the Italian cooperation is still prioritizing a lot food security, <clears throat> investing a lot in agriculture and, um, and rural development, uh, especially in ecological and organic uh, production methods, small scale agriculture, and also a strong focus on youth. So this is all very uh, reassuring. I, I want to apologize um, for my bad time management but uh, this was so interesting. I I, I, um, I I lost track of time. But if uh, if I can ask for your permission to um, have uh, you know five ten more minutes, um, there's some already some conversation happening on the chat. Uh, let me give um, uh, opportunity to anybody to just uh, raise their hand and ask a question live. Uh, in the meantime, let me ask uh, maybe Maria if you have had a chance to look at uh, some of the questions uh, there. Quite interesting on the uh, aspiration mismatch and uh, and uh, the mismatch between the labor market. Please. Yes, great. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, well. First of all, the discussions for the great discussion and uh, very interesting examples that uh, that complement uh, greatly. Uh, the the work that we have done. By the way, before proceeding, I also actually want to highlight something. You know, I don't want to steal all the fame here today. And uh, June is very modest, but uh, it must acknowledge that she was the one who conceptualized uh, this work and led the beginning of it. So, uh, uh, voila, as they say in French. Uh, now, regarding the question, so I've seen also indeed that um, that there were also some answers, but. Um, uh, on the mismatch of aspirations, whether that a better match uh, leads to better employment opportunities, I'd say yes. Uh, well, there is actually some certain evidence. What we say about uh, speak about aspirations, um, it's not necessarily about the exact skills. It's about what young people want to do. Uh, and they often imagine a lot, like they want to be lawyers, they want to be diplomats, you know, they want to be in the government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then when we look at their skills and uh, the uh, employment opportunities in the area, we see that there is no match to that reality. And that creates a lot of frustration. Uh, but this frustration uh, is also um, partly driven by the fact that the jobs that exist um, actually are often of bad quality and badly perceived, right? Uh, so if we could manage to, uh, well, improve the quality of those jobs, uh, but also change the attitude towards them, because we actually would uh, kind of prove by experience that these are also good jobs to go into, uh, that may lead to a better matching. We also know from other studies generally that whenever uh, people don't match well to the existing jobs, this can lead to different types of uh, scenarios, such as over-education, under-education, horizontal mismatches. And more generally, when this happens, this leads to a whole range of inefficiencies, inefficiencies uh, in terms of productivity loss, 
in terms of disinterest in work, in terms of uh, loyalty towards the work you're doing, you know, enhance like disconnection from work uh, much more easier. So yes, I would say better matching of aspirations on skills to what is out there, but also improving the quality of those jobs so that we can attract people to those jobs uh, uh, is important. Uh, the second question was very quickly on how do we uh, channel uh, opportunities to where there is demand, right? Uh, so I guess this is where we are trying to, uh, to say in the report that, yes, there are some areas and there are some sectors where the, the use is there, the uh, job demand is there, uh, but there is nothing out there. Right. So what do we do with these people? So this is where I believe the anticipation is important. And this is where the role of, let's say, governing government um, in channeling, um, uh, in creating job opportunities, in creating um, factories, let's say, uh, creating, uh, uh, stimulating businesses uh, is important. It's kind of, you know, uh, the government should be really playing this role of a corrector of market failures, right? The market failure in this setting would be that, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense for any individual private actor to go and set up a factory somewhere where there is a, a huge demand, right? Like, uh, or a huge supply, huge supply of labor, right? Uh, there is no like individual incentive, right? But collectively, everybody would benefit had there been, let's say, a factory, a school, a hospital in an area, right? So this is where, again, the government should step in to um, correct those market failures and create uh, those opportunities. The last question is, how can this be done? Because we know what to do, but how to do the question is. So... Again, in the report, we do have specific examples, but perhaps the main takeaway is that indeed at some point there should be a whole of a government approach. So it should not be just one ministry responsible for this, but it should be several ministries coming together and developing this kind of vision. How do we go about this? And we do have examples from other countries where uh, strategies were developed for development of certain sectors or for development of certain activities, strategies developed by several ministries, then taken to the cabinet of ministers, right, for the approval, creating this interministerial strategy with then actions that are taken by each individual ministry under their remit, under their responsibility, right? And then uh, this is how you go together to a common vision. So that's uh, that's perhaps the the key message I'd like to to share. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> I think is there um, any raised hand? Uh, I saw Syria at some point. Any last burning question, and then I'll pass over to Elizenda. I I think next time we will schedule for an hour and a half so that we have more time for discussion. Because I had some questions myself, but I will refrain. Uh, anyone uh, live would like to ask a question, please go ahead. You can just take the mic. No, okay, so the question is, is disappeared. All right, well, I don't wanna take up more of your time. I think this is this has been really, really interesting. I have, uh, you know, lots of questions, but I, I think I'll just ask them bilaterally to uh, Aix and, and, and Chiara uh, afterwards. Uh, Elisenda, can can we, um, I'll let you do the difficult job of uh, wrapping this up. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I am not scared of that talent. So thanks a lot for those who have joined us today. I think for those who couldn't, they will be able to uh, nonetheless join us afterwards. So I, I hope that what we have discussed today will also entice more discussion uh, in the follow-up. Um, I've heard a lot of interesting things, um, uh, specifics to, to this region, actually for the uh, working group is one of these opportunities to discuss things also specific to a sub-region um, when it comes to, to rural youth employment. We have heard uh, about this very interesting OECD report. So thanks a lot, Maria, for sharing that with us. It's been very illuminating, but also we have heard through Chiara and Federica 
concrete examples no, on how this translates to the ground. This is something that in the working group we are always discussing, no? how then we, we move forward and what are the intervention models that are actually working on what's not working and, and what can we build on that. Some takeaways that are specific to the region, of course, is their context specificity with regards to the difficulties that their young population is facing. So this long um, education or like transition no, to the labor market, these gender inequalities that are still pervasive in the, in the region. Nonetheless, the opportunities that offers the agri-food sector um, for both young women and men, we've seen some lessons learned out the, of the projects, no, from Mike's, but also from from the ILO in collaboration with IFAD, and I'm sure there are many more there. I like also the the fact that there are opportunities not only in the production side, but also in the um, in the processing and and so on and so forth, and and we have heard also about the discussion on the wage employment, and I cannot, of course, I'm from the ILO, I underline the importance of rights at work and social dialogue in ensuring no, that young people are part of the process and to ensure that then they find the opportunities attractive to make a living, not only in the agri-food sector, but also in rural areas, no, because that's where they will ultimately live. And well, I hope that we will have more of this. I, I joined Ji Jung in saying we needed more time. Um, there was much, a lot, a lot to cover. So we will discuss on also how we can follow up on this discussion of today. So thanks a lot, everybody. And I hope we will have an occasion to meet soon. Thank you so much, everybody. And until the web next webinar, I say goodbye. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.